thought that was an excellent introduction, Alan, that you did to that last song about searching the heart and, and God searching and how Paul was doing that with Felix. W one little correction. Uh, the reason why Felix called Paul was because he didn't have Twitter or text at that time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, we've been uh, doing a study on the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and um, I think the premise I started with and continue with is that when Luke said in, in Acts chapter 1 that there are many infallible proofs, I think we should be able to find some of those. So that's what we've been trying to do. And uh, here's the three critical questions that we've been asking, and, and really a couple of these we've already solved. But was Jesus really dead after that whole thing that they put him through? And we, the first week, we gave lots and lots of information. Uh, absolutely true. I think that's indisputable. Uh, there's no way it couldn't be true. And then was the tomb empty when they went to it Easter morning? Yes, that's, that's the testimony of many people. Uh, but also um, those not in favor of it being empty, like the Roman soldiers. And they were reporting to the authorities and to the, to the uh, officers that the tomb was empty. They wouldn't have done that. They didn't want it to be that way. Their lives depended upon it. And the um, religious leaders who definitely didn't, they just wanted to get rid of Jesus, suppress the whole thing. And they were stating the fact as well. And then, um, then the real question is, did people actually encounter him after his resurrection? That's so vital to you and I because Jesus, did he really raise from the dead? Did he really die for sin and then prove that by rising again and, and um, being seen by many other people? And we believe yes. The facts are pretty obvious that yes, of course, he died and was buried. And three days later, his tomb was empty. The question is, so where was Jesus? So what we've been doing for the last bunch of weeks is looking at all the different appearances, and here's six of them for you that we've already gone over. Um, most of those, the first five, all took place the day that Jesus rose again. Uh, that was the first Easter morning. Those five uh, encounters took place. Last week, we looked at the one that took place a week later on Sunday evening, and if you notice, it says in number five that there were 10 disciples, and in number six, there were 11 disciples. Thomas, who was the one missing all along, he had gone that entire week um, bombarded with all his comrades and friends pleading with him to believe them that they saw the resurrected Jesus, and the whole time saying, I can't comprehend that. That's just beyond my understanding. And until I see him, until I touch him, I'm not accepting that. And then that week later, I mean, what a week that had to have been for him, a horrible time. And that week later when uh, Jesus came, and I think especially just for Thomas, came in and presented himself. And as far as we can tell from the text and everything we know about Thomas, the little we know about him, but the lot we know about human nature, I'm real convinced Thomas didn't walk over and touch him. I think he fell to his knees immediately and declared, my Lord and my God. And um, <clears throat> I'm convinced. Today we want to look at the time when he appears to seven other disciples. And exactly when this happened, we really don't know. Um, we're not real sure, so there's no sense in, in trying to project when it did. Uh, I think it did definitely happen after they were assembled with the 11, probably days later, maybe longer than that, but they had uh, traveled back to Galilee at this point. Now think about what whirlwind had just happened for all those followers of Jesus. Um, you know, if we go to this point with the seven disciples, we're talking in the last two weeks, maybe three weeks, think of everything that happened. Here they were. Um, they were receiving from Jesus, from his lips. They were watching things going on in his life and events that were taking place and hearing from his lips teachings that were just amazing, too much to even anybody to absorb. Then all of a sudden, 
all their hopes and expectations are shattered and their concept of the kingdom has just gone out the window. And one of their own has actually betrayed Jesus and turned him over to the authorities. And then um, comes this, this um, crucifixion thing and a band of followers who were all together at one time and, and so connected to Jesus um, are going to betray him and, and flee away from him. They're going to be scattered. And, and just in a matter of hours, literally, for them, they had gone from being part of the disciples of an honored and popular teacher to now their associates with a hunted down criminal who's been dishonored as an imposter. If that's not enough, then comes all the craziness around, you've got to be kidding. The tomb is empty. What's happened? Where's he at? What's going on? And then one after another, testimonies of people saying, I saw him alive. He appeared to me and he spoke to me. And then later they could say, he came into the room where we were. And, and others saying, we sat and ate with him. And, uh, and it's just like, this is just too much, too much data in such a short amount of time. <clears throat> I'm sure they felt like their time in Jerusalem was very unreal. It was just no way we could ever comprehend what they were experiencing. So at some point, somewhere along the line, and maybe there's been a few days, uh, maybe nothing's been going on, you have to somewhere get back to normal. Even all of you and, and different tragedies that you've experienced in your life, sooner or later you have to get back to whatever normal is called in to you or anybody else. And so you want to get back to that familiar. So they go out to Galilee, and um, they're probably in need of food and shelter and, and all those kind of things. So we come to John chapter 21, and uh, I'm going to read to you the first eight verses that read a little bit like this. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's also the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Jebedee, that would be James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but... That night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, Well, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, we believe that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Hmm. Peter's the one who's just always seems to be in the middle of things and the leader. And as they were trying to, in my opinion, get back to normal, Peter thought of what his normal was and said, you know what, I'm going back to fishing. Now, whether he thought he was going back for that for the rest of his life, I don't think so. But it was a way to do something. It was something to do. It was a way to maybe make a little bit of money. And, and so it was what he knew. The others seemed to join willingly. You don't see any debate like, well, shouldn't we wait to see what Jesus wants us to do? Or didn't Jesus tell us that we have another plan? Or uh, you don't see that argument going on. So getting back to normal to them seemed like the right thing, and that meant going fishing. The Bible tells us, John tells us, there were seven of them that were there. John was one of them, so he would know. <clears throat> he named five of them. And you can read every commentary you want uh, and they will suggest who they think the other two were, but the truth is no one knows. We don't know who the other two were. Uh, there's good guesses, but 
you just don't know. It's all speculation. Um, so they finished fishing that night. They went out and uh, typical to what they do in, in that part of the world, fish all night long. And, and they come back in, and it's now early morning. Their boat's coming back in, and there's absolutely nothing in it. And um, they're very discouraged. And it kind of reminds you of what happened once a little bit before that, recorded in Luke chapter 5, when Peter, probably Andrew, James, and John were fishing all night long, and they came back, and there was Jesus on the shore, and he told them to try again. If you remember, Peter's like, oh, master, we fished all night. We didn't catch anything. Uh, okay, if you say so, we'll try. And they brought a haul in so much that it almost sunk the ships. And when Peter was, you know, they were celebrating, enjoying, wow, look at all this catch. And then Peter turns and looks at Jesus and says, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. <laughs> and Jesus makes a statement to Peter at that time. And he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And I'm wondering, you know, why didn't Peter think of that right now? You know, and he should have been like, wow, this, this is deja vu all over again. You know, here I am, and, and it's exactly what happened a year or so ago. And Jesus told me then that I'm going to be catching men and people. Well, when we come back to our John 21 story, the voice calls out um, to those frustrated fishermen, and said, lads, you don't have anything to eat, do you? <laughs> and their answer is, we don't have anything to sell or to eat. Uh, no, was their answer. And, and one of the commentaries, which I think was pretty valid observation, said they may have thought that this was someone from a nearby town who was there to purchase fish for their market. And so here comes a fishing boat in, and he asks, hey, do you got something? And they're like, no, 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 nothing to sell. We don't even have enough to eat for us. And so there's nothing there. And he tells them, he said, well, then, why don't you do this? Why don't you put it on the right side? If you remember from the Luke 5 passage, they, they almost wanted to debate Jesus. That, you know, you kind of get the impression Peter was about ready to blurt out back then that, come on, Jesus, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing. What do you mean put the nets here or put the nets there? We've been fishing all night. And in this case, they didn't seem to be quite as um, in disagreement with it. And one of the commentaries that I read said that the, the sound of the language um, made it seem like they interpreted that whoever this guy was, that A, he cared, and B, he knew what he was talking about, maybe. So for whatever reason, they decided they were going to just go ahead and, and throw that uh, out aside. And they get an incredible haul of fish. The miracle was so impressive that they even actually counted the fish. And John decided to record it. Um, he said there was about 153 of those fish there. And it's at that time John declares it is the Lord. It's Jesus. And I wondered, did he recognize his voice, his miracle? How did he know? I, I think it was the miracle that pointed out. And John's the first one to recognize him, but Peter's the first one to act. That's typical, isn't it? Peter put his outer garment back on. He was probably out there fishing and the heat and all that and and got nice and relaxed. He was in his fruit of the loom and, and then decided, well, if I'm going to swim into Jesus, I'm going to put my cloak back on me. And he did that. And then there's the invitation that Jesus gives in verses 9 through 14. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and it was a full, large, uh, full of large fish, 153 of them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. That's interesting. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. 
Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So there he is on the shore, just like before, he's prepared breakfast for them. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They've eaten with him and fellowshiped with him many, many, many times before. In fact, it doesn't tell us here that Jesus actually ate any of this. This part doesn't tell us. But we did see on at least one or two other occasions already that when Jesus in his post-resurrection body appeared to the other ones, that he did eat food with them. Kind of interesting. So we know he's able to do it. We just don't know that he did it on this occasion. No reason to think he didn't, but we don't know for sure he did. His return to them somehow seemed to just bring a continuity to their relationship. It's getting more and more back to natural relationship, caring, enjoyment, fellowship, love, all that going between them. And, the, and his presence and his fellowship is bringing strength to these disciples. Now, John said here, and you probably caught it, John said that this is the third time he appeared to the disciples. And you're looking at me and you're like, well, Pastor Bud, you have this as number seven on the board. And I would say the reason why is this is the third time he's appeared to the disciples as a group or a group of the disciples. Uh, there were the other individual things, Mary Magdalene, Peter by himself, other situations like that. But this is the third time as a group. And I found it interesting, of course, Dave knew what we were speaking on and, and knows the, the, where we're heading with all our studies. So the music is always appropriate for what we're doing. And, and Alan's introduction was so good about um, Paul challenging Felix and then, his, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now you're getting into my heart because that's exactly what happens here in the rest of the text. Now it's not about fishing and it's not about breakfast and it's not about enjoyment. Now it's about getting into the heart. And that's what Jesus is going to do in the conversation with Peter. And this is the part of the text that's usually most concentrated on. So I'm going to start in verse 15 and I hope to read down through 18. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, I prefer Jonah, but son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, and he said that he asked the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. I said, this is the part of the text that most people really focus on, and there's good reason. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff here. It's very possible that Jesus restored Peter to fellowship. If some of you have been around for a while, have heard me say that I really like what I think is Mike Prinovich's theory. I want to give him credit. If it's wrong, it's still his. But, um, but I think he's right when he felt that the reason that Peter ran past John and raced down into the tomb to see, did Jesus really raise again? Are the, are the linen cloths still there rolled up? That the reason Peter did that is because Peter had denied Jesus and he wanted to make sure that he was okay, that he was able to be forgiven, that he was in relationship with the Lord again. I think it was part of his repentance and his brokenness over this. And so I, I think that's why Peter ran into that. And here, I, I believe that when 
you know, Mark 16 and Luke 24, also 1 Corinthians 15, uh, just refer to the fact that somewhere during the morning of Easter, the first resurrection day, that Peter had a visitation with the resurrected Jesus. We don't know any of the details about it. I personally think that Jesus restored him, received him back to himself at that time. That was so needed for Peter because look at how he failed. Look at what he had done. <clears throat> but here, all of a sudden, Jesus is um, cross-examining Peter. And it's a very tough time. And I think this one is necessary for Peter, but for the others as well. I think they needed to know that this Peter, who had so violated his Lord when he was going through his trials and prior to the crucifixion, and had so sinned against Jesus, and the others were probably at least somewhat miffed or highly offended by him, they needed to see Jesus receive him back. They needed to see what it was like to be fully forgiven. We all need to see that, don't we? Isn't it wonderful that Jesus will receive us back no matter what failures we have done, no matter how bad it has been, when we break our hearts before him, he receives us. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. And I think that's what we see happening here. So Jesus questions Peter, questions him three times. Something I want to remind you about, and you're thinking, oh, you want to remind us that he denied him three times. Yeah, I do want to remind you of that. But I also want to remind you that when they were in prayer prior to the crucifixion, Jesus told Peter, I've been praying for you because Satan wants to sift you and wants to just make you come to pieces. And I'm praying for you. I think this case here is part of the answer to those prayers that Jesus prayed for Peter. This is part of the process of being restored and received back by Jesus. And the three denials had a lot to do with it. Now, the rest of the stuff I'm gonna tell you here is gonna be really confusing. And so if you need to clock out for a minute or two, go right ahead. I'll try to bring you back in when, when we're back on task. But in the Greek, there's, Jesus uses different words than Peter uses. Uh, and Jesus uses it twice, but then on the third occasion, he surrenders, not really, but he surrenders and, and uses Peter's word. Here's the words that he uses. You know the word agape. Most people know that a little bit. <clears throat> he uses some form of agape when Jesus twice asks him, do you love me? The word agape, I mean, there's so much richness to it, but basically it just means that you're seeking what's best for the other one and, um, and you're self-sacrificing. And others, I like to use the phrase when I'm meeting with couples and stuff that are getting ready to get married. I say, you know, it's not a 50-50 proposition. It's a 100-0 proposition. And you give the 100 and you get zero. That's love. That's love. And so that's sort of, you know, the divine agape love, sort of, um, because this is going to get confusing in a couple of minutes. And then phileo, you know, the brotherly love, it's the friendship, the fondness, the family kind of love. And, and those are all really, really good. Okay, it's going to get really muddy here because these words are interchangeable in Scripture sometimes. For instance, I'm just giving you a couple examples in... Um, the word phileo is used in chapter 5 when it's talking about the Father's love for Jesus. And I would say, well, no, you, John, you should have used agape, you know. It's like the deepest, richest love. But he used the familiar, fondness, family, uh, Philadelphia love. And then it's also used in, uh, for the Father's love for the disciples. And it's like, okay, sort of I get that. And, and for Jesus' love for John in chapter 20, the disciple whom he loved. And, and it's like, okay, but I still would have used agape for that. But then in John 3, 16, it says that God so loved or agape the world. And, and I want to say, well, now, wait a minute. 
you self-sacrifice love the world, and I know you do, but you sort of friendship, brotherly love Jesus. So don't get hung up on the words because they can be used interchangeably. There is richness to the difference. Now the thing that's really frustrating is when I tell you that the conversation between Jesus and Peter probably took place in Aramaic. And in Aramaic, there's only one word for love. So John is writing this paragraph out in Greek and, and using the different words. But my own opinion, just my own, is that somewhere along the line, John and Peter probably had a conversation about this. And I think that it was probably pretty clear that the way John communicated it was exactly the way Jesus was intending it. I don't think there's anything wrong here. I'm just telling you that he probably brought it out richer for you and I to, to see and to understand. So with all that in mind, you can wake up again. Um, what do we make of this? What does it all mean? Well, here's what's going on. Jesus was, first of all, publicly affirming Peter. That's really, really important because Peter is going to be that foundation and his testimony is going to be the foundation of the church, the bride of Christ. And Peter's going to have, and that t testimony going to have the keys uh, of the church and heaven and hell. So that's really important because Peter had failed and he's now being received back. I really like the fact with God, failure is never final. <laughs> it's never final. You can always go on and do more uh, when God is involved and Christ is involved, no matter what you have done. Well, also, uh, it's because he's searching Peter's heart. And I put on there that he's doing it for Peter's sake, just so you don't get messed up. Jesus knew Peter's heart. He had no problem knowing everything. Uh, remember in John chapter 2, when Jesus... Um, was with Nathaniel, and he told him what was in his heart and his mind. You have to study that on your own. But uh, he did. He pulled that out, and it says he knew his heart because he's made man, and he knew what was inside of man. Jesus knows your heart inside out. I, here's something I will guarantee. I will guarantee that Jesus knows your heart better than you do. Absolutely, I guarantee that. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 17 that our hearts are wicked, deceitfully wicked. Who can know them? Who can understand the heart? I can't understand my heart. My heart races in the wrong way sometimes, and I've got to pull back the, the reins and try to get it. And sometimes I succeed. Sometimes I don't. The heart is, is a terrible thing. And Jesus knows your heart. Peter's responses are probably demonstrating some hesitancy. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me and would sacrifice and give everything for me? And Peter's like, Jesus, you know I love you as a brother. And Jesus says, but do you, do you have that self-giving, uh, only interested in me kind of love? And Peter says, but I have this fond, friendly family love for you, Jesus. And then Jesus said, okay, do you have a Philadelphia brotherly love for me, Peter? And he said, Jesus, you know everything. You know everything. Yes, I have that brotherly love for you. I think Peter was hesitant because he knew how he failed him. I think he was afraid. This is my own opinion. I think he's afraid to admitting to the deepest, most committed love in fear of what's going to happen next. <laughs> what am I going to do next? Look how I have failed you and how, how rough it was. And then Jesus starts to tell him, well, then, you know, feed my lambs and tend my sheep and, and all those kinds of things. Back in Luke 5, Jesus had told Peter that you're going to catch men. You're going to be responsible for 
for overseeing and shepherding and catching and tending for the care and the souls of men. And I think he's reminding him of all of that right now. And the scriptures tell us, uh, you know, the word feed, feed the lambs. And it means basically supply them with food, take them to pastor, help them to grow. And, and he used the word lambs, the, the tender young ones. And if we convert that into human talk, it's like provide spiritual nurture so that those who are young in faith can begin to grow and can be, become strong. And he also used the word tend, uh, tend to sheep. And that means, um, you know, just take care of everything that a sheep needs. Uh, it's the feeding, the grooming, the housing, it's everything. So as they, in people words, as they grow stronger and more mature, keep nurturing them, keep tending that. Peter got that. Peter got that lesson. Later on, he writes um, what we call First Peter. It's a letter. And then also Second Peter. And in First Peter chapter 5, in verses 1 through 4, He's specifically addressing the leaders in the church, and he tells them what they need to do, and it's these very same things. He uses the word shepherd, shepherd the people, and, and care for them, feed them, and tend for them. Peter got it. It was pretty amazing and pretty wonderful. I think it was really important for Peter to understand that he needed a love for Christ because it would be his love for Christ that would keep him going at the work that Christ called him to. Peter, you're going to be ministering to a lot of people who, oh, by the way, are just like you, Peter. <laughs> they're going to fail. They're going to look really bright and great, and then they're going to mess up. And you need to remember that you love me, and that's why you're helping them. That's why you're ministering to them. And I think Jesus would say the same thing to you today. There are people in your acquaintance and in your life that you are trying to minister to, and you're not able to do it unless you stay focused on the fact that you love Christ and you're doing it to honor and to serve him. I'm not going to read it, but the rest of the uh, verses down to verse 23 it's kind of unfortunate because Peter kind of turns around and says, remember it said that you were going to be led to places you don't want to be led to. They're going to take you by your hands when you get older. Almost sounds like a nursing home. But in his case, some people feel like they, um, uh, they, they believe that this was talking about how he was going to die. And it is talking about how he was going to die. And some believe that he was crucified and that when he was going to be crucified, he said something to the effect of, I'm not worthy to die the death that Jesus did. So many believe he was crucified upside down. Well, anyhow, that was telling Peter, you know, you're going to come to a violent end. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like hearing those words from God. Um, that's scary. But anyhow, that's what Peter was told. And he immediately does a Peter thing, which is okay, but it's Peter. He turns and he says, well, what about him? <laughs> what about John? What's going to happen to him? And, G and Jesus says, you know what, if, if I decide that John is going to live until I return again, that's not your issue. You need to live for me. And he says to him in verse 22, you must follow me. Now, that's a second person pronoun, personal pronoun, and it's singular. And he's saying to Peter, you know what, I don't worry about everybody else, Peter, it's you. And it makes me think of 2 Corinthians 5.10, where it says, we know that we all must stand before the throne of God to give an account of what we have done in this life, whether it's good or evil. And it's like, on that moment, when I'm standing before Jesus and giving an account of my life, I'm not going to be able to say, yeah, well, what about them? <laughs> because we're going to be face to face with Christ. Jesus is saying a couple of neat things here. One of them is that, you know, what's next to my, my prophetic calendar? It's my return. <laughs> my return's next. And if, you, if I want John to live till my return, by the way, he didn't, but if I want John to live till my return, that's none of your business. That's what's coming up next. And he said, follow me. And Peter could have asked, although he wouldn't have, 
He could have asked, well, where are you going that I follow you? And um, Jesus was going, of course, to heaven, but what he was doing is what he's doing today. He's preparing places for us, and he's preparing his plan and his program of his kingdom that's going to be brought in. So what about us? The evidence of the resurrected Jesus is overwhelming. We need to love Christ, and we need to feed and tend his sheep. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word, and what a great experience and example. Uh, we don't want to beat up Peter. Well, he's a great man, and, and we so admire him, and we're so grateful for this encounter because we know that you restore sinners to yourself. You receive them back. Thank you for doing that for Peter, and we know you do it for us. And Lord, in, in so doing, uh, it cleanses us, it, it restores us to fellowship, it gives us strength because of your presence in our lives. And we pray that above anything else, we would respond to you and would be able to honor and serve you faithfully. And may Jesus Christ be praised. Amen.